Well, if you're able to kneel with me as we seek the Lord in prayer. Mm -hmm. Dear merciful Father in heaven, we are so thankful, dear Lord, to be called your sons and daughters. We're so thankful for your mercy and grace. We're so thankful, dear Lord, that we'll be able to be here in this Sabbath to worship you. We're so thankful, dear Lord, for Institute this day so that we may come together and study your word. So thankful, dear Lord, for your word that you gave it to us so that we may know more of you. And as we continue on our study today and this Holy Sabbath, I humbly pray for the double portion of thy Holy Spirit upon thy servant and help us to understand and open our hearts the word said, if it's for your honor and glory. So, Lord, please be with us today. Bless our brother George. Bring things in remembrance. Cast out an evil spirit, dear Lord, that tried to distract our mind. And help us to remember to keep your Sabbath holy. To you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. We humbly ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Now, <clears throat> recently, uh, we had some uh, certain things happening within the Bayswater Fellowship that have made it quite clear that the devil has attacks lined up for all areas of the Adventist Church, both in the uh, affiliated congregations and also in the unaffiliated congregation. I'm sorry, I'm going to put my face up here so you can see me talking. Okay, now, uh, I think that this is a good time for us to start to look in a bit of detail at some of the heresies that are bothering uh, especially conservative Adventists like ourselves and start to uh, take a good look at why we reject them. Excuse me for a sec. Okay. The heresy that I want to take a look at today is known commonly by many as the New Theology Heresy. And the reason I tried to focus on this one is I came across uh, a gentleman, part of the mainstream Adventist church, who wrote up a nice little uh, run of detail, which I thought was a very good summary of the new theology, but not completely. It, I dare say he's somewhat confused, but I'll read out what he had to say. What he had to say was, I am a gospel Adventist. You might ask, aren't all Adventists gospel Adventists? And he believes that the answer is not necessarily or no. And so he then can contrast two types of Adventists. One is known as the law Adventist and the other one's known as the gospel Adventist. So let's, uh, with that in mind, we'll read through his points. First one, the law Adventist. You are a sinner because you sin. The gospel Adventist says you sin because you are a sinner. All right. Now I've got quite a bit to say on that, and we'll come back to that in a moment. All right, number two, the law Adventist says sinlessness is possible prior to the second coming of Christ. The gospel Adventist, sinlessness is impossible prior to the second coming of Christ. I've got quite a bit to say on that one. And now the third point is law Adventists say be good and God will love you. Gospel Adventists say God loves you, now go be good. The next point, law Adventists keep the law in order to be saved. Gospel Adventists keep the law because you are saved. And the next point is law Adventists work towards salvation. Gospel Adventists work from salvation. All right. Ooh. Oh, here it is. Ah, 
The next one is law Adventists focus on overcoming sin and and gospel Adventists focus on lifting up the Saviour. And finally, law Adventists have no assurance of salvation until the second coming. Gospel Adventists full of assur assurance of salvation here and now. Now, as you heard those statements, I'm sure many of you will find that there are things that you potentially agree with and things that you do not. Okay. So let's now go back to the ver first couple of points. The first one said, the law Adventist, you are a sinner because you sin. Gospel Adventist says you sin because you are a sinner. Now, there is a few problems I've got with this stance. When sin first came into the world, it came through Adam and Eve. So the question I would ask, did they sin because they were sinners? Because if they did sin because they were sinners, we then have the problem that God did not create perfect beings, but rather he created sinners. So we've got a problem right there. In fact, I would say, based on this situation alone, that we are sinners because we sin. But let's take it a little, little bit further. The above stance says that we are born sinners. Now, the early church eventually took on this stance. This is in the, process, the time when they were transitioning from being the Church of the Early Fathers to the Catholic Church that we see today. So the early church eventually took on the stance and it created a problem for them. And the problem was, what about the babies that were born and died before being baptised? They don't have a chance to repent. So by their thinking, those babies will be lost. and go to hell. Well, what's the solution? Well, they came up with one, and this stance eventually led to the push for infant baptism, a practice carried out in the Roman Catholic Church by many even today. And I'm going to go one step further and say it will eventually lead to the same push by gospel Adventists to carry out the same practice. Now, does the Bible actually teach this? Now, some may say, yes, it does, because I'll point to that verse in Psalms that talks about how in iniquity I was born in sin. I came into this world. And it therefore says, see, because he was born in sin, therefore he is a sinner. But there's a problem with that. I could have been born in a garage, but that doesn't make me a car. I could be born in mud. That doesn't make me mud. And so we need to take a closer look at that verse at some stage, but I do not believe that it teaches that we are born sinners, but rather that we are born in the environment of sin. And is there anything that we can go to to try and support this? Well, Let's go, first of all, to Numbers chapter 15, verses 22 to 29. And I'm going to, I, I like reading long um, Bible passages because it helps me to get a feeling for the sur whole surrounding situation. Now, in this particular 
uh, Bible passage, we're focusing on the sin of ignorance. And so we'll start at verse 22 of Numbers 15. And if ye have erred and not observed all these commandments, which the Lord has spoken unto Moses, even all that the Lord commanded you by the hand of Moses from the day that the Lord commanded Moses, and henceforth among your generation. Then it shall be, if aught be committed by ignorance without the knowledge of the congregation, that all a congregation shall offer one bullock for a burnt offering, for a sweet savour unto the Lord with his meat offering, his drink offering, according to the manner, and one kid of the goats for a sin offering. The priest shall make an atonement, for all the congregation of Israel, and it shall be forgiven them, for it is ignorance. And they shall bring their offering, a sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord, and their sin offering before the Lord for their ignorance. And it shall be forgiven all the congregation of Israel and the stranger that sojourneth among them, seeing all the people were in ignorance. And if any soul sin through ignorance, then he shall bring a she-goat of the first year for a sin offering. Amen. And the priest shall make an atonement for the soul that sinneth ignorantly. And when he sinneth by ignorance before the Lord to make an atonement, and it shall be forgiven him. Ye shall have one law for him that sinneth through ignorance, both for him that is born among the children of Israel and for the stranger that sojourneth among them. Now, there's a couple of points I want to bring out here. One is that God is being merciful because he knows that you can sometimes do the wrong thing through ignorance, and he's not going to hold you necessarily guilty, but he does expect you once you are aware of it, to do something, and it's the sin of ignorance. That's number one. Number two, I look at verse 29, which says, Ye shall have a, one law for him that sinneth through ignorance, both for him that is born among Israel, and for the stranger that sojourneth among them. In other words, both for the citizen and for the alien. And this is where the doctrine of jurisdiction comes from. If you live in a particular country, you abide by the laws of that country insofar as they conform to the laws of the Bible. In other words, the same law for everybody. Now, what about children? Children are deemed innocent, and I'm going to say without biblical support at this point in time, the general concept was that Jesus was about 12 years old when he first went to the temple, and he went to the temple because he had reached what was deemed the age of accountability, which is commonly regarded by the, the, the Jewish nation as being about 12 years of age. So Jesus was 12 when he first went to the temple. And it was very interesting that right from that point onwards, he spoke about his father as being somebody apart from Joseph. Now, Matthew 8, 14 says this about children. These are the ones who have not yet reached the age of accountability. Matthew 18, verse 14. Even so, it is not the will of your father which is in heaven, that one of these little ones could perish. So God is deeming children to be innocent until the age of accountability. Now look at John 9 verse 41. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. So what is Jesus saying here? If you didn't know it was sin, you wouldn't be regarded as sinful. But because you say that you see, that you are able to perceive your sin, therefore you are guilty 
of your sin. So on this concept, I'm going to reject the idea that I sin because I'm a sinner. No, I am a sinner because I sin. When I reach the age of accountability, I know that I have committed sin since that time. Therefore, I'm in need of forgiveness. Because the young ones are deemed innocent when they're born and up until the age of accountability, they are not regarded as sinners. Okay, let's look at this next one. The next one says, Law Adventist says that sinlessness is possible to prior to the coming, second coming of Jesus Christ, where the Gospel Adventist says sinlessness is impossible prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, I myself tend to be of the former camp. And I believe there's quite a bit of reasoning as to why there is. And the first reason has to do with one of the commands of Christ. Let's go to Matthew 5, verse 48. Matthew 5, verse 48 has this to say, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, I want you to think to yourself about all the other commands that Christ has given to people in the New Testament. And how did those people respond when he gave them those commands? So he commands a cripple to rise up and walk. What does the cripple do? He rises up and walks. What does this tell us? Well, it tells us that when Christ gives us a command to do something, that he also gives us a capability to carry out the task he's given us to do. Like, take a look at this verse again. Is it a request or command? Earlier today, we were considering the story of the Samaritan woman and Jesus did not command the woman to give him a drink. He requested one as a favour. But when, Jesus, when Christ gives us command to do something, we take a look at this one, Matthew 5, 48 again, Be ye therefore perfect, even as our Father, your Father which is in heaven is perfect. That is a command. If it is a command, then the capability to be perfect here on earth goes with the command to be perfect. If part of the Father's perfection is sinlessness, then that can only mean that sinlessness is possible right here, right now. Now, I found a couple of small statements that Ellen White had to say. The first one is found in Volume 8 of Testimonies, page 64, first paragraph. She had this to say, As God is perfect in his sphere, so man may be perfect in his sphere. Now let's consider that. God is perfect in his sphere. What can God do? Well, we know, we know from the properties of God, being omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, everywhere. Uh, sorry. Omniscient is to know everything. Um, omnipresent as to be everywhere. So he is able to do all of these things we cannot, but that's his sphere. Our sphere is to be the image of God. And as God's image, we are perfect. Because if we're not, 
then God has created something that is imperfect. But then if we go and look in the signs of the times, November 5, 1896 and paragraph 3, she elaborates a little bit more. And so we'll read the same statement again, but it's got a little bit more detail. It says here, as God is perfect in his high sphere of action, so man may be perfect in his human sphere. Now, is this perfectionism? Well, maybe it is. But it's the kind of perfectionism that is achievable. Does the Bible record the perfect character of anyone in the Bible? Well, let's ask that in another way. Does the Bible have people who have no record of sin recorded against them? Well, let's think of a few. What about Abraham? Abraham does have sin recorded against him, his lack of trust in God, therefore passing his wife off as his sister. So it can't be Abraham, but we do have people like, and we can't have Moses because he lost his temper. Um, and there's, there's quite a few other people. King David, man after God's own heart, he was not perfect. Sin was recorded against him, but we do have a few. And I can think of Enoch, had nothing recorded against him. Joseph did not have anything recorded against him. And anything that might be um, considered against him is more by inference than by direct record. And Daniel didn't have anything recorded against him. And possibly his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Now, we all know everyone sins. But I will, for the sake of the class today, consider these to be perfect simply because the scriptures record no fault against them. So in other words, in the eyes of God, they are perfect. And were they perfect before they died? It would seem so. Okay, so we've got the next three statements I've grouped together because they're all very similar. And if you listen carefully, you'll probably see why. So the first one says, be good and God will love you. That's the law Adventist. The gospel Adventist says, God loves you. Now go be good. Uh, law Adventists keep the law in order to be saved. Gospel Adventists keep the law because you are saved. Law Adventists work towards salvation. Gospel Adventists work from salvation. Now, this is where the author of this particular set of points and I will disagree quite, quite strongly. I very much doubt that there is any Bible carrying Adventist who would go along with his the way he's portrayed things here. Are there Adventists who are thinking the way he refers to here as law Adventists? Well, definitely. I've heard some struggle with this. And yet I've heard many in the Bayswater Fellowship affirm what he refers to as gospel Adventism. But even then, I don't think he has his gospel Adventism right. So I'll give you, I'll give you a brief summary, summary of the situation. And I invite you to critically analyze what I say and discuss it after the service. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. 
And it goes like this. It says, but we are all as an unclean thing and our righteousness are as filthy rags and we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Now, if I'm going to read this ver verse, uh, at, uh, by the time I'm finished reading it, it's quite clear to me that the Bible is saying that there is nothing we can do to earn our salvation. In fact, if we think about it, God already owns everything, including ourselves. There is nothing that we can offer God that is not already his. In fact, I'm even tempted to think that our of our good works as something that already belongs to him. So let's consider where do works come into the picture? We know that our works will not save us, but they will damn us. And Jesus makes that clear in the parable of the sheep and goats, which we discussed in the lesson earlier today. So let's then try and consider where works are in salvation. And the way we can get uh, an idea of where they are in salvation is to consider the following question. Are works the seeds of salvation or are they the fruit of salvation? Now, I maintain that we don't do good works to get saved, but rather do them as an act of thanks to God for saving us. Hence, the answer to the question is that works are the fruits of salvation. When Jesus came to the fig tree, he was looking for fruit. The curse came upon the fig tree for its lack of fruit. Matthew 21, 19. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only and said unto it let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever and presently the fig tree withered away now if i read that correctly it sounds like the fig tree instantly withered away it didn't take its time now <clears throat> It has been fruit by which I personally have judged people in the past and even now. When Desmond Ford came out regarding his claims on the investigative judgment, that came to my attention in 1980 and I didn't know what to do with it. I actually turned to my father because I did uh, have a lot of um, trust and confidence in my father in terms, I'm talking about my earthly father, um, in terms of his attitude towards Christianity and, and doctrine. He was as, um, what shall we say, he was uh, as fundamental as I come when it came to Adventism. And he, to his credit, was a big fan of uh, Dr. Ford. But in this case, he and he could not agree with what Dr. Ford was saying. He didn't speak critically of the man, but he did say he couldn't go along with that. Now, it took about... 20 years to finally come down to a judgment and that judgment was on account of the fruit of that doctrine. It was be because of his stance that he eventually came to regarding Genesis 1. He rejected the idea that the six-day creation was in fact six days. And then when I found out why, the reason why was because he had 
a way of interpreting the 2,300 days of Daniel. And it was pointed out to him that the same language pattern was also in Genesis 1. And he was left with the option of either admitting he was wrong on the investigative judgment matter, or he was going to have to reject Genesis 1. And he chose the second option. To me, that was a fruit. And as soon as I found out that he had rejected the six-day creation, especially on account of the way that it was written, and that he would, that and that he obviously found it easier to do that than to admit he was wrong. Then I knew that he was definitely wrong on the investigative judgment. And I am also judging the corporate Adventist church by the fruits that are manifesting themselves on the account of the ordination of women. And Christ will judge us by our fruits. So our works are a manifesting, man, sorry, manifestation of our salvation. I like to think of our works as a way of continually thanking God for saving us from destruction or damnation, if you prefer. Now, the next one says that the law of Adventists is a focus on overcoming sin. Gospel Adventists is a focus on lifting up the Saviour. Now, I've got a couple of problems with this stance. Now, for the, first of all, the Saviour has already been lifted up. When we focus on the uplifted Saviour, we are be going to behold sin in our lives that we will want to have removed. Let's take a look. John 12, verses 32 and 33. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. So the Apostle John is telling us what this lifting up involves, and that is Christ's sacrifice cross. Now, if I go to Hebrews 10, verses 10 to 12, Hebrews 10, verses 10 to 12. And we read, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right of hand of God. So this lifting up of Christ has already been done and was only to be done once. However, if we behold our Saviour and continue to do so, the Bible promises us the following. In 2 Corinthians 3, chapter 3, verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So, why will we continue to lift up the Saviour? Because it seems to me that the Bible only speaks of lifting up the Saviour in the context of his sacrifice. So if I'm lifting, lifting him up now, then I am effectively sacrificing him again. And the Bible's quite clear that it was only supposed to happen once, not multiple times. But by beholding the Saviour, we will see sin in our lives and we can have that taken away. In fact, we can pray for it and continue to pray for it. Now, 
this next one is going to have a, have me doing a little bit of reading here because this is the last point that he has to say regarding um, law versus gospel. He says the law Adventists say that there's no assurance of salvation until the second coming, whereas the gospel Adventists say full assurance of salvation here and now. Now I'm of the view that he is a little bit confused here. Um, we, and I believe most of the Basewater Fellowship, already accept that by accepting Christ as our Saviour, we already had the assurance of salvation here and now. But what we also accept is there's no assurance that we will maintain this stance between now and the second coming. Because the Bible does speak of this possibility. I was having a, a chat with uh, one of our one of our people here. I don't think he's here now, but uh, during the the break, and we were chatting about the idea that we can sin after we've accepted salvation. Yes, we can. But let's look at what Hebrews ten. Verses 26 and 27 have to say on the subject. It says, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. What this implies to me is that we have the possibility of losing our salvation up until the time of probation. Now, the curious thing here is that when our salvation is sure, that after that point, that this will be when we are least confident of the certainty of our salvation. Consider the time of Jacob's trouble. His lack of confidence came from the sins that he had committed earlier in life. And now I'm going to go and finish off the sermon today with a couple of passages from Alan White. Now, I'm going to read a little bit above and a little bit below, and I'm going into the Great Controversy, and I'm actually looking at the 1888 edition, page 616, paragraph 1 but I'm reading just above that. And the, uh, the reading starts as such. As the Sabbath has become the special point of controversy throughout Christendom and religious and secular authorities have combined to enforce the observance of the Sunday, the persistent refusal of a small minority to yield to the popular demand will make them objects of universal execration. It will be urged that the few who stand in opposition to an institution of the church and the law of the state ought not to be tolerated, that it is better for them to suffer than for whole nations to be thrown into confusion and lawlessness. Now, the same argument about 2,000 years, I'm going to, and I'll read it as it says, the same argument 1,800 years ago was brought against Christ by the rulers of the people. It's actually 2,000 years ago now. It is expedient for us, said the wily Caiaphas, Caiaphas, sorry, that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. This argument will appear conclusive and a decree will finally be issued against those who hallow the Sabbath of the fourth commandment, denouncing them as deserving of the severest punishment and giving the people liberty after a certain time, to put them to death. Romanism in the old world and apostate Protestantism in the new will pursue a similar course toward those who honour all the divine precepts. The people of God will then be plunged into those scenes of affliction and distress described by the prophet as the time of Jacob's trouble. Thus saith the Lord, we've heard a voice of trembling 
of fear and not of peace. All faces turn into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. And that's got a reference of Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 5 to 7. Now, in Jacob's night of anguish, when he wrestled in prayer for deliverance from the hand of Esau, it represents the experience of God's people in the time of trouble. Because of the deception practiced to secure his father's blessing intended for Esau, Jacob had fled for his life, alarmed by his brother's deadly threats. After remaining for many years in exile, he set out at God's command to return with his wives and children, his flocks and herds, to his native country. You notice here that Jacob is going according to God's command. And then upon obeying God's command, he then finds himself in this trouble. We usually expect by obeying God's commands, everything will work out well. Well, that's not necessarily the case. But we are still measured on our obedience nonetheless. Anyway, on reaching the borders of the land, he was filled with terror by the tidings of Esau's approach at the head of a band of warriors doubtless bent on revenge. Jacob's company, unarmed and defenceless, seemed to about to fall helpless victims of violence and slaughter. Do you notice here that this is going to be the way that the people will be in the time of Jacob's trouble at the end, unarmed and defenceless. And to the burden of anxiety and fear was added the crushing weight of self-reproach, for it was his own sin that had brought this danger. His only hope was in the mercy of God. His only defence must be prayer. Yet he leaves nothing undone to a on his part to atone for the wrong of his brother and to avert the threatened danger. So should the followers of Christ, as they approach a time of trouble, make every exertion to place themselves in a proper light before the people to disarm prejudice and to avert the danger which threatens liberty of conscience. Now, Just got to jump a couple of uh, paragraphs here. Um, sorry. Oh, here, here it is. Right. Now, having sent his family away, that they may not witness his distress, Jacob remains, remains alone to intercede with God. He confesses his sin and gratefully acknowledges the mercy of God toward him. While with deep humiliation he pleads the covenant made with his fathers and promises to himself in the night vision at Bethel and in the land of his exile. The crisis in his life has come. Everything is at stake. In the darkness and solitude he continues praying and humbling himself before God. Suddenly a hand is laid upon his shoulder. He thinks that an enemy is seeking his life and with all the energy of despair he wrestles with his assailant. As the day begins to break, the stranger puts forth his superhuman power. At his touch, the strong man seems paralysed, and he falls, a helpless, weak king suppliant upon the neck of his mysterious antagonist. Jacob now knows that this is the angel of the covenant with whom he has been in conflict, though disabled. And suffering the keenest pain, he does not relinquish his purpose. Long has he endured perplexity, remorse, and trouble for his sin. Now he must have assurance that it is pardon. The divine visitant seems about to depart, but Jacob clings to him, pleading for a blessing. The angel urges, let me go, for the day breaketh. But the patriarch exclaims, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. What confidence! What firmness and perseverance are here displayed? Had this been a boastful, presumptuous claim, Jacob would have been instantly destroyed, but his was the assurance of one who confesses his weakness and unworthiness, yet trusts the mercy of a covenant-keeping God. 
He had the power over the angel and prevailed. Hosea 12 verse 4 Through humiliation, repentance and self-surrender This sinful, erring mortal prevailed with the majesty of heaven. And then she goes on to say, and I'm skipping some paragraphs here, Satan influenced Esau to march against Jacob, so he will stir up the wicked to destroy God's people in the time of trouble. As he accused Jacob, he will urge his accusations against the people of God. In other words, they will make sinners out of saints. He numbers the world as his subjects, but the little company who keep the commandments of God are resisting his supremacy. If he could blot them from the earth, his triumph would be complete. <laughs> he sees that holy angels are guarding them, and he infers that their sins have been pardoned, but he does not know that their cases have been decided in the sanctuary above. He has an accurate knowledge of the sins which he has tempted them to commit, and he presents these before God in the most exaggerated light, representing this people to be just as deserving as himself of exclusion from the favour of God. He declares that God cannot in justice forgive their sins and yet destroy him and his angels. He claims them as his prey and demands they be given into his hands to destroy. Okay. Now, that was one of them. And there is another one. I had it. Ah, oh, there it is. In spiritual gifts. In spiritual gifts, we've got a whole chapter, chapter 36, which is called The Time of Jacob's Trouble. And she speaks about how she sees the saints leaving the cities and villages, associating companies together and living in the most solitary places. But we then come to the time where she soon sees the saints suffering great mental anguish. They seemed surrounded by the wicked inhabitants of earth. Every appearance was against them. Some began to fear that God had left them at last to perish by the hand of the wicked. But if their eyes could have been opened, they would have seen themselves surrounded by angels of God. Next came the multitude of the angry wicked, and next a mass of evil angels hurrying on the wicked to slay the saints. But as they would attempt to approach them, they would first have to pass this company of mighty holy angels, which was impossible. The angels of God were causing them to recede, and also evil angels pressing around them fall back. And yet, they, all, they are wrestling with God like Jacob. The angels long to deliver him, but they must wait a little longer and drink of the cup and be baptised with the baptism. The angels, faithful to their trust, kept their watch. So you can see what's happening here is that the people, even though they know that probation is closed, they don't know where they stand. They don't know what the final outcome is. And their struggle is a mental anguish. An anguish. Nothing to do with the people that are coming down to try and kill them, but rather, what is their situation in relationship to God? So, am I a gospel Adventist or a law Adventist? Well, I'm inclined to think that I am partly both. There are some aspects of what this gentleman has written that I reject. There are some that I accept. As far as this last one is concerned, I am of the view that we have full, of salvation, full assurance of salvation here and now, but at the same time, I can also recognise that it is entirely possible for me to lose that salvation by not valuing that salvation to its full extent. And for that reason, I pray that we, as members of this fellowship, will reject the new theology that preaches that we are born sinners, but that we are in fact born innocent, that God will hold us innocent for the commands of the ignorant. Try that again. That God will hold, hold us innocent for the 
sins of ignorance, things that we've done that we didn't know we did, and that he will help us to continue to behold him so that we can have all sin removed out of our lives in time for the close of probation. This is my sermon for today. May God add to the preaching of his word and give us the understanding that he desires in our preparation for the kingdom to come. Amen.